So I'm Rebecca Rogers. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Bioinformatics and Genomics at UNC Charlotte. But I'll be telling you about uh, one of the last projects I did as a postdoc when I was at UC Berkeley with Monty Slack and working on genome sequences for woolly mammoths. So woolly mammoths were some of the more prevalent large herbivores from around 200,000 years ago up until about 10,000 years ago. They were grazers and they foraged on the open plains and they ended up defining the landscape around them. They had these uh, flat plate-like grooves on their teeth that helped them grind up the grasses. And then as the climate warmed, trees grew up over a lot of the Siberian steppe. And this was bad for the mammoths because unlike mastodons, they couldn't forage in the forests. And so their habitat became limited. Along with this, there was a lot of predation, especially from humans. And these woolly mammoths can actually be used to track the migration of humans through Europe long before you can recover any direct evidence of human remains. In modern populations that hunt elephants, there's an artery that runs across an elephant's cheek. And if you can target that, then the elephant will bleed out very quickly, which is one of the ways to guarantee that you have a kill that day and something to eat. But it also takes the elephant down quickly enough that it reduces the likelihood of injury to the hunting party. And they can find spear marks on cheekbones of woolly mammoths that would be difficult to mimic through any other means long before they have any direct evidence of human remains there. Woolly mammoths are also really important for paleontology because they have such well-preserved remains. A lot of them lived in places where it's cold, and the Arctic explorers, as a lot of you probably know, found woolly mammoths frozen in the ice with soft tissue still intact and even fur on the skin. In La Brea, you can also go to the tar pits where lots of Colombian mammoths got trapped in the tar and they've been able to recover whole skeletons from multiple individuals and even get information about population level variation. And when I was a kid, I thought this was almost as close as you could get to having a time machine. Here are these animals and they died tens of thousands of years ago, but we still know what they look like. We know a lot about the variation in the population and, um, and what even their soft tissue uh, uh, looked like in, in the tarp. So, um, when I was in kindergarten, I heard about this and then I went home and got all the National Geographics out that had anything about mammoths. I told my parents I wanted to be a mammoth explorer and then they sat me down and had to talk about getting a career that would actually pay the rent and support yourself. And you know, this is everything a kindergartner needs to hear. So I uh, ended up giving up on some of those dreams and became an evolutionary geneticist. But then one day something very magical happened and that's that Eleutheri Apocopolo at the Swedish Museum of Natural History working in Lova Dahlen's lab ended up publishing genome sequences for two different mammoth specimens. And someone put this up on Twitter and I'm like, hey, where's the data? And so the first day it was available, I clicked download and started crunching it. So one of these sequences comes from a juvenile individual that was found frozen in the ice with soft tissue still intact. And the other comes from a tooth that actually came from Wrangell Island. So Wrangell Island is off the north coast of Siberia, and it was the last refuge of woolly mammoths. And they ended up persisting here another 6,000 years after everything on the mainland went extinct. And as you can clearly see, it's a bleak and desolate place. I wouldn't sign up to have a summer home there, but for the mammoths, it had a small patch of grassland and some scrubby weeds that ended up being suitable habitat for the mammoths. This island is very dangerous to get to, and humans didn't arrive there until 3,700 years ago, coincidentally, exactly when they go extinct. Um, but it's often hit by these high Arctic cyclones, and it will decimate all the plant life on the island so that trees can't grow there. And that doesn't sound like a fun place to hang out, but if you're a mammoth, that meant that their habitat remained suitable for them. To put this into perspective, at 3,700 years ago, the pyramids have been put up in Egypt, Ur of the Chaldeans has risen and fallen, Stonehenge has been put up in England, and people have started to domesticate things like maize in the Americas and horses in the Arabian Peninsula, but somehow, for some reason, no one ever ended up domesticating a woolly mammoth, which is a shame. <laughs> so we have one specimen from this island right before the mammoths go extinct, and the other one is from the mainland from around 44,000 years ago. One of the questions we often get is how did the mammoths arrive on this island? Well, at 14,000 years ago, we know that mammoths were able to go back and forth from the island to the mainland because there was a series of ice sheets and the ocean levels were lower. And the isotopic ratios of strontium to calcium in these bones suggest that they went back and forth over their lifetime to forage in these two different locations. 
At 12,000 years ago, we know that the glaciers had melted, the sea levels rose, and the island was completely cut off from the mainland. And at that point, the isotopic ratios suggest that the mammoths were spending their entire lives on their island. If you're a paleontologist, this is what happened in between is the subject of fierce debates where knives come out at a conference if you say the wrong thing about how often um, the mammoths may have been able to traverse across only in winter, how wide was the channel at different points when the, the climate was in flux. But we know by 12,000 years ago, they could have, they spent their entire lives on this island. The other question is how far could a woolly mammoth swim in Arctic waters? We know that elephants are really good swimmers. They're buoyant. They hang out with their trunk above the water like a snorkel. And they have phenomenal endurance where they can swim up to 50 miles a day. So long as an island is within about 100 miles of shore, they're often some of the first large mammals that arrive at islands. And they arrive there before any of their predators do. And we see this common repeated theme of island dwarfism that actually happened with the mammoths as well. They were short, only 10 feet tall instead of 14 feet tall, which still is pretty big, but for a mammoth, that's tiny. And we know in modern populations, when you have dwarf elephants, that they often get driven out of the herd, especially the males, and they don't have good survival rates without their pack. Regardless of how they got to the island, the isolation is written in their DNA. This plot shows effective population size. So the size of a population you would need to explain the genetic diversity that's seen in, in the different mammoths. And over time, it starts off high, it drops a bit, they recover. And the oimicom mammoth comes from this point in time in the past, 44,000 years ago, when the populations of mammoths are happy and healthy, and there's lots of mammoths out roaming the open plains. And the, the evidence in the DNA supports that as well. And then on the island, the population drops and drops and drops, and in fact, we know that this poor mammoth is doomed. So I kept presenting results in lab meeting, and Monty said, you know, maybe you should stop looking at this because, you know, every time you do, it looks worse and worse for this mammoth. And I'm like, Monty, you know they're already extinct, right? <laughs> so this is a really interesting system to work in if you're the girl who always wanted to work on woolly mammoths. But it's also a really interesting system if you're the girl who does evolutionary genetics. There were mathematical theories that were developed that describe how DNA should be changing under different population dynamics. And one proposal was that when you get small populations, that chance plays a bigger role and you get more effects from sampling variation. And under those circumstances, bad mutations that would be outcompeted in a very large population will end up persisting in the population just by chance alone. And genetic drift will overwhelm the forces of natural selection. Instead of survival of the fittest, it's just survival by chance. And so long as your effective population size times your selection coefficient times four is less than one, then it operates under neutral dynamics. If it's greater than one, the natural selection can see that mutation and drive it out of the population. And the cutoff is actually shockingly sharp if you run the simulations. So here we have two mammoths one from a point when you have a very large effective population size, and, one, and then a huge drop in that population size in a single species. And this is a pretty unusual scenario. So a lot of people had done descriptive work suggesting that differences between species might be due to these rules. But here we have a snapshot before and after a change in the effective population size. So this is a good opportunity to look at nearly neutral theory. Really, that's crap. I just wanted to work on woolly mammoths. And so I downloaded the sequences. I started doing what I do, which is to try to identify different mutations. But really quickly, the story popped out that was obviously consistent with nearly neutral theory. This mammoth from the island has an excess of deletions, an excess in the proportion of deletions that affect gene sequences. He has an excess of retrogenes, which are formed when selfish DNA proliferates at the expense of its host, which we usually think is a bad thing. And they have an excess of premature stop codons uh, that would break proteins and damage the genes. And all in all, this mammoth has 50% more of his genes broken compared to the mammoth from the mainland. And if someone offered to break 50% more of your genes, I don't know anyone in this room that would sign up for that. In genetics, it's pretty unusual to have everything in a single genome tell you the same kind of story and even just the Fisher's combined p-value of all these different classes of mutations could be significant. But then the question is, I've only got two mammoths, so what can you say from this limited data? 
Fortunately, I was working with Monty Slatkin, who is a population genetic theorist. He invented a lot of the methods that are used in kits like 23andMe and Ancestry.com to look at your DNA and tell you where your family came from. And so he knows these models like the back of his hand. And so we can use theory to put bounds on what you would expect from variation in a single population. If you do that, the Wrangell Island mammoth is 28 standard deviations below the Oymukon mammoth from the mainland. And so even if some of the parts of the theory maybe aren't the perfect fit, we can still say it is just flat out not possible that these two mammoths come from a similar population operating under similar dynamics. We then took a look at the ratio of mutations that change amino acid sequences that would alter the